Hello, my name is Scott Turner. I'm a professor of neurology and director of the Memory Disorders Program at Georgetown University. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to talk about the appropriate use of biomarkers and diagnostics in people with early memory disorders and cognitive deficits, particularly focusing on Alzheimer's disease. With regard to Dr. Nadelson Love's patient, Mr. F, who came in with memory complaints, this was confirmed by an abnormal result on one of the cognitive screening tests, the quick cognitive screen. It was not due to depression, and all of his reversible labs were normal. He did have a couple of confounding issues, and that was some pain from arthritis as well as some hearing loss, but he was wearing his hearing aids. Um, he was sent for a plasma screen, specifically the Precivity 2 test, which indicated a high APS2 score or Alzheimer probability score because he had a high percent phospho tau 217 and a low A beta 42 to 40, 40 ratio in the plasma. He was interested in perhaps getting treatment with one of the new anti amyloid antibody therapies that are recently FDA approved. And so he went on to have an amyloid PET scan that was also positive and indicating uh, amyloid in the brain, supporting the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and providing rationale for the treatment with the antibody therapy. So the first uh, biomarker was FDG PET or fluorodeoxyglucose PET was developed decades ago. It's still useful in clinic, uh, particularly in distinguishing Alzheimer's disease from frontotemporal dementia. So here we have representative uh, FDG PET images on the top row is a typical Alzheimer patient with the red, yellow, and green representing hypometabolism or decreased uptake of the glucose uh, um, from the blood. So we have uh, temporal and parietal hypometabolism in a typical Alzheimer's patient. And the next is an atypical presentation with language first uh, symptom otology uh, before memory. And you can see a very left-sided, predominant temporal parietal hypometabolism. Lewy body dementia, or DLB, uh, has a pattern very similar to Alzheimer's disease, but often also involves more occipital hypometabolism. So sometimes can be helpful in distinguishing Alzheimer's from Lewy body. But frontotemporal dementia has a very different pattern than Alzheimer's disease. And in the behavioral subtype, you can see the frontal hypometabolism on the fourth panel there. Sometimes frontotemporal dementia presents with a non-fluent aphasia, again, a language-first presentation, and you can see predominantly left-sided frontal hypometabolism. And then there's a, a rare variant of frontotemporal dementia, which is anterior temporal hypometabolism, also called semantic aphasia or semantic dementia. So that was a glucose PET, and as I said, we still order that sometimes for distinguishing frontotemporal dementia from Alzheimer's, but... Many other biomarkers have been developed since then, including imaging biomarkers, starting with volumetric MRI, then moving to amyloid PET, and then more recently, tau PET. We've also begun to look at proteins in spinal uh, fluid by lumbar puncture, A beta levels, total tau, phospho tau 181, neurofilament light, and then more recently looking at plasma biomarkers from blood samples, including the A beta 42 to 40 ratio, neurofilament light, phospho tau 181, phospho tau 217, and others. We also put these biomarkers on a time course, and we discovered a whole new er uh, variant of Alzheimer's, which is the preclinical Alzheimer's. So you can see these biomarkers are becoming abnormal long before there are any clinical signs or symptoms. So the first biomarker to become abnormal is decreased amyloid in spinal fluid, an increased amyloid plaque by amyloid PET imaging. And that's the red curve on the left. You can begin to see other biomarkers begin to change before there's any cognitive decline. The first vertical dotted line is the boundary between preclinical Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment. And this is when symptoms begin and memory and cognition declines greater than expected for age and education. The second vertical dotted line is the boundary between mild cognitive impairment and dementia, and this is when the cognitive deficits begin to impact daily function. So you can see we have now three stages of Alzheimer's disease, the preclinical stage with normal cognition, the mild cognitive impairment, sort of a precursor to dementia, 
and then the full-blown dementia, mild, moderate, and severe of Alzheimer's disease. Because the amyloid biomarker becomes abnormal first, we've developed this amyloid cascade hypothesis that amyloid is necessary but not sufficient to develop dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. You can also see this sort of a ceiling effect in the amyloid curve, and so there's no correlation between cognition and amyloid burden. And this would argue perhaps against the amyloid hypothesis, but our current uh, hypothesis suggests that any amyloid triggers the tau pathology, the tau pathology triggers the cognitive decline, and then the cognitive decline ultimately leads to functional uh, losses. These are the FDA-approved biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. We have three that are approved for amyloid PET. These were based initially on Pittsburgh compound B, which was a C11 uh, compound similar to thioflavin, which binds to the amyloid. But we now have fluorbetapyr, flutometamol, and fluorbetaben, all FDA-approved, all very similar, and useful for imaging amyloid by PET scans. We only have one tau pet ligand that's FDA approved so far, that's fluorotalsapir, but there are many others in progress. It's interesting also that there may be specific tau pet ligands for other tauopathies. Just to show you what some of these amyloid pet images look like, we have flutometamol, which is in the color on the top left. You can see the negative uh, amyloid pet at the top, and then the positive, uh, which looks uh, very different in the next row. These compounds are somewhat uh, um, lipophilic, and so they do bind to white matter tracts. So all of the uptake that you see in the white matter in these negative images is just nonspecific white matter uptake. When you see signal uptake next to the skull and the cortex, that when, uh, that's when the uh, indicates that there's amyloid plaque within the cortex. And so you see the very positive image with flutometamol imaging in the color. Fluorbetaben and fluorbetapyr are red as black and white images. And again, you see the nonspecific uptake in the white matter tracts, but when you see the cortical uptake, especially uptake adjacent to the skull, that's indicative of a positive amyloid PET scan. In the lower right, we have a tau PET scan, a negative at the top and then positive at the bottom, showing uptake of the tau PET ligand in a temporal and parietal cortex. This is our uh, classification scheme for these biomarkers. A stands for amyloid or A beta, T for tau, and N for neurodegeneration. And, and A could be measured by spinal fluid A beta, A beta 42, or their ratio, or by amyloid PET. Tau could be measured as uh, reflecting neurofibrillary tangles or other tau pathology, particularly CSF phospho tau 181 and phospho tau 217, as well as tau PET imaging. We also have N biomarkers, or evidence of neurodegeneration or neuronal injury, which is volumetric MRI, glucose PET scan, and total tau or neurofilament light in, measured in spinal fluid. Just to show you how we use these in clinic, on the left panel is an Alzheimer patient, and the right panel is a normal age match control, a 75-year-old individual with dementia and hypometabolism shown in A in the top left, with uh, typical hypometabolism and temporal and parietal cortex with sparing of the primary sensory motor cortex. In C and D, we have uh, MRI imaging, and we can see there's much more atrophy or loss of brain volume, particularly in hippocampus and medial temporal cortex in the Alzheimer patient compared to the age match control. And in E and F, we have amyloid PET imaging. So very robust amyloid uh, uh, deposition or uh, ligand uptake in E compared to the nonspecific white matter uptake shown in F. So these are three biomarkers, uh, glucose PET, volumetric MRI, amyloid PET. So the Alzheimer patient would be considered A plus, T unknown because we don't have a tau biomarker here, and N plus. So we have uh, two markers of N neurodegeneration which is the volumetric MRI and the glucose PET. And the uh, H-matched individual is A minus, T unknown, and N minus. This is a, a table showing, again, the three amyloid PET uh, ligands and the one tau, tau PET ligand. Tau PET is, is not obtained clinically, but is useful in research, and we're increasingly using amyloid PET clinically to determine who is eligible for anti-amyloid antibodies. 
Spinal fluid proteins, including a beta 40, 42, and phospho tau, are equally useful in supporting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And these are just two of the vendors that are available for um, measures of amyloid and tau proteins in spinal fluid. Now, we also have uh, patients who don't read the literature, and they look exactly like Alzheimer's disease, but they don't have any positive amyloid biomarkers. And so we're trying to determine, is this Alzheimer's disease or not Alzheimer's disease? Many practitioners would say if there's no amyloid, then this is not Alzheimer's disease. And they're called SNAP, or suspected non-Alzheimer pathophysiology or non-amyloid pathophysiology. Some of these individuals have tau pathology, as measured by tau biomarkers, and they're called PART, or primary age-related tauopathy. They're A minus, T plus, and unknown. And some of the SNAP patients have a different protein aggregation, uh, TDP43, so they're called late or limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. And these are um, new class classification of patients that were just really defined by the development of these new biomarkers. This is more evidence that these biomarkers begin to change long before diagnosis. So diagnosis uh, shown by zero on the far right on these tables. And you begin to see these biomarkers changing 5, 10, 15, 20 years before there's any clinical presentation or certainly before diagnosis. So on the top, there's a beta 40, there's the ratio of 42 to 40, and then total tau, volumetric brain MRI imaging, phospho tau 181 in spinal fluid, neurofilament light in spinal fluid. So all of these show that in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease compared to age-matched controls, there's movement of these biomarkers. So uh, we can begin to define this preclinical stage and we can make prognostic statements about who might develop Alzheimer's disease. And these biomarkers are also useful in finding the right patients to uh, enroll in prevention trials, which are now underway for people who are at risk of converting to mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. This is reflecting the same data in a different way. So zero on the far right is the time to diagnosis at the time of diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the clinical dementia rating scale, some of boxes begins to change about five years before diagnosis. But the amyloid levels begin to change about 17 years in spinal fluid uh, before diagnosis. So again, uh, useful for um, making prognostic statements. Increasingly, we're using these new blood-based biomarkers or plasma levels of A beta 42 and their ratio, which decreased with Alzheimer's disease. There are markers of neurodegeneration, such as neurofilament light and total tau in plasma, which increase in, in plasma of Alzheimer's disease, and also increased tau metabolites, including different phosphotau epitopes, phosphotau 181, 217, 231, and other tau species. And we can also measure proteins of neuroinflammation or gliosis. And these are proteins such as GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, or soluble TREM2, a, a marker of myeloid cells, uh, inflammation in the blood. And these are some of the vendors which are um, marketing these blood-based biomarkers. We're increasingly using them in uh, the research studies to determine who should go on to get the expensive amyloid PET scans or the invasive spinal tap. But now we're starting to increasingly use these in the clinic. I don't know if we're quite ready yet uh, to use the uh, plasma biomarker to make uh, to support a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Whereas the gold standard is still considered spinal tap, spinal fluid, or PET imaging. But this is a very rapidly developing area, and we hope or we think that with uh, further research, uh, a lot of the PET imaging could be replaced by these plasma biomarkers, and a lot of the spinal taps could also be replaced by these plasma biomarkers. This is just one study showing clinical validation of one of these uh, vendors, and the test is called Precivity AD2. And it, um, the uh, inclusion of a phospho tau 217, or the percent of tau 217 that is phosphorylated compared to non-phosphorylated p-tau, um, is, in, is included in this Alzheimer prediction score too. So the A-beta ratio and the percent 
phosphor tau 217 gives you a curve such as those shown on the left. So in the left panel are individuals who have a negative amyloid PET scan, uh, indicated by the centaloid level of less than 25, compared to the right, which has a positive amyloid PET scan with a centaloid level of about 25. And you can see the cutoff value with a fairly good performance of this APS2 score, also indicated by the ROC curve on the right. But also very interestingly, you can see that the um, ROC curve for percent phospho tau 217 is equally good to that of the APS2 score. So what this indicates is that measuring percent phospho tau 217 not only tells us about tau pathology, but also tells us about amyloid pathology, even though we're not directly measuring amyloid in this percent p tau 217. Also, the uh, and shown in red is the A-beta-40 ratio, which performs less well compared to the P-tau-217 and the APS-2 score. So this is the more updated version of our uh, classification scheme for these biomarkers. We have the core AD biomarkers, core 1A for amyloid again, or A-beta, and then also specific CSF plasma P tau species, which are considered now T1, which are the phospho tau 181, 217, or 231. Core 2 are other tau species which are less specific to Alzheimer's disease. These are P tau 205, microtubule binding region 243, non phosphorylated tau, and a tau PET imaging. Again, we have the N for neurodegeneration, which is CSF or plasma measures of neurofilament light or volumetric MRI or glucose PET. And now we've also added an I category for inflammation, and this is uh, GFAP as measured in CSF or plasma. Additional biomarkers could be added, such as uh, evidence of vascular brain injury uh, shown by MRI scan or alpha-synuclein pathology, as shown by the CSF alpha-synuclein seed amplification assay. So just to summarize, uh, this is a very uh, exciting and rapidly moving field. Imaging and fluid biomarkers are useful for screening, for diagnosis, for prognosis, for patient monitoring, and also for proving target engagement of novel therapies now uh, in, in uh, clinical trials. Imaging and fluid biomarkers are increasingly incorporated into the diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. And one of the controversies in our field is when do we actually call it Alzheimer's disease? Is it when someone develops memory problems or when someone has abnormal biomarkers indicating that memory disorders may be coming in the near future? For treatment with the newly approved antibodies for Alzheimer's disease, which are lecanemab and donanemab, Confirmation of amyloid pathology is mandatory. And this right now, the gold standard is either amyloid PET or less frequently CSF amyloid levels. But we think and we hope that plasma proteins would be able to replace these uh, expensive and invasive tests in the near future. So plasma biomarkers are increasingly used in research and also now coming to the clinic for many patients for screening to determine who should go on to have an invasive CSF or expensive amyloid PET scan. In the future, plasma biomarkers may be used to screen normal individuals at risk in order to begin prevention treatments uh, to prevent the onset of MCI and Alzheimer's disease in those who are considered at risk. So thank you for listening today. This is a very exciting area and subject to uh, change in the near future as we learn more and more about these imaging biomarkers as well as the plasma-based biomarkers. Thank you.